So here's some observations I have on my own behavior. I find that I am more likely now than ever before to look for something at Amazon first rather than going to the store. If I've got to go looking at one thing, like, let's say, peach folders. Yeah, I could have gone to Staples. But I looked up online and I saw how much they were on Walmart. I then looked online and Amazon and found out that they were about the same price. And guess what I did? I just ordered Because I didn't want to put on the mask, drive to the store, de sterilize, do everything, go into Walmart and buy. Do you, any of you else find that your behaviors kind of change because of that? Yeah, I feel more lazy for sure. Just, it's almost like it's such a hassle that it's not even worth it. Mm -hmm. And I'm much more apt to go for to take my dog for even a longer walk than they normally do. Gracie's looking at me like, oh, please, not two and a half miles. What the hell are you doing to me? <laughs> because it's the one chance that I can be outside without a mask. Winter scares me, because he's out of me. Does it scare anybody else about the thought of the fact that we'll be inside all the time wearing masks? Or is it just me? I just hope it doesn't last like too long. Too long? Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so what's the first thing you get like to your room? Like when you get in your car, you take, or you get to the room, you, you feel like a relief when you take off the mask? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. When I walk to the car, I take off the mask. I love to go home. I feel a relief. You feel relief? My daughter described it as being a tad bit claustrophobic. Yes. And I thought it was actually an interesting way to describe it. It just said it's a little like. And then when you start leaning down and you start working on something, I find it even worse. Like if I'm sitting at my computer doing it, then I'm leaning this way. It does, it's going to modify our behavior. So as we think about marketing and people selling things, think about how we have to modify fans' behavior. For instance, let's say we go back to the football game and we go to a football game for the Chiefs. All right, here's a drink. What's the problem with the mask? Yeah. So you gotta go like, but most games don't have stronger band, right? Lizard band. You get your beer, or of course your beverage if you're not sleeping. You get your beverage, it doesn't have a lid, it's open. That means you're gonna have to take off your mask to drink it. So if you think about it from a consumer behavior perspective, even if major league Football goes back in. Let's say the Chiefs. We'll use the Chiefs as an example. They've been thinking about modifying it to what is it? 25 or 50%. 25 to 50%. How are they going to sell a beer? How are they going to sell a soda? How are they going to sell one of the, you know, the ones that are talking about the lemonade ones that are kind of frozen and they use with a spoon? You know, they're talking about the really good, but they only taste good in sporting events. They never taste the same anywhere else. I don't know why. Anyway, any of those things, how are you going to sell those? Peanuts, hot dogs. If you take off your mask, you just basically violated what they're trying to do. So they're going to have to modify the way that they have people eat. Straws are going to get back inside. The turtles are not going to be happy. Or, yeah, or they start handing out cheap, you know, um, metal straws. Well, actually, it's kind of cool. It's emotional, isn't it? Yeah. Cool. Cool. You know, because it is one of these things. Environmentally, straws are like one of the worst things for the, you know, the ecology, especially marine. So I was thinking about that today, and I was realizing that I think my behavior is definitely changed as a consumer. Um, I become, I guess, lazier in some ways, in a sense, because I just don't want to deal with it. And then yesterday, I went to all the games. And I went to, um, let's pick something up in the theology up here. And I realized that they weren't sanitizing the carts. <laughs> like, what was that panic attack? I mean, I literally almost lost it because I was so used to people sanitizing the carts. So there I am whipping out my hand sanitizer, wiping it over the, but it's become kind of part of how we think, isn't it? And it's going to be interesting. Once, you're right, once this gets packed, are we going to go like berserk the other way? Or are we going to become the cleanest country in the world because we've all sanitized everything within an inch of its life? Or are there going to be a bunch of kids who have no immune system because they've been living in sanitized bubbles since they were born? I heard that. 
Okay, because okay, how many of you played outside when you were little? And how about ate dirt? Daniel, I know you ate dirt. Come on, let's make it. Okay. <laughs> and we all ate something, right? We made mud pies, we ate dirt, we chewed on the end of, I don't know, sticks. We did all sorts of stupid things, right? But anyway, my mother used to always say, hey, a little dirt isn't going to kill you and probably make your immune system better. Anybody else hear, ever hear that? Yeah. Okay. Well, a bunch of kids right now, they're not allowed to play outside without masks, which means they're not eating any dirt. But that also means they're not being exposed to all the other germs. So we're modifying all of our behavior. It's going to be interesting. It'll be interesting as the year goes on. So let's watch out for any kind of things that we see out there that modify our behaviors as consumers. We can talk about a few of the thoughts. So here's the introduction. So guess what? We're the most diet conscious group of people in the world. Has anybody realized that? We spend a lot of time talking about our diet, but we don't do a lot of good work on actually keeping our diet in, in control, do we? So we're the most obese country and at the same time, also the most conscious. And because of that, we adjust our strategies. We adjust the sizes and the ways that things are. We talked a little bit about diet and light products. Um, we talked a little bit about reduced calorie. We talked about the fact that things are labeled low test cholesterol. Like for instance, Cheerios. Cheerios will lower cholesterol. Now Cheerios has been around for 50 years probably, right? And yet all of a sudden that we lower cholesterol because that is something we're consciously aware of. Things that are low fat. Before we probably didn't pay any attention to that. Now we do. Movie theaters, airline seats have become smaller and smaller and smaller. Thus, if you happen to be a bigger person, it's harder and harder to fit in those seats. Automakers are though, on the other side are making wider models. They're making the seats bigger. They're trying to make sure that people can fit into them because you don't want to get into a car and immediately feel packed. Are you going to buy a car that makes you feel packed? No. Now, if you're short like me, every car makes me feel short. Take my word on it. You get in a car, I gotta pull the seat up. It's just the way it is. I mean, there is no car in the world where the seat isn't gonna go forward. Um, and I'm gonna have to pull it up or move it up so that I can see. But I know that. Short people are used to that. But you don't wanna feel fat in a car, and you don't wanna feel like, you know, you're you're, you're too big or too wide, or just your shoulders are too broad. Americans have broad shoulders. We are not a, we have a lot of big, broad shoulders. And because of that, we tend to let it put fit into our cars. That's the reason why trucks and SUVs are very popular. Same thing with sturdier chairs, couches, bed frames. Does anybody's mother have that one chair that only certain people are allowed to sit in? Oh, come on. Am I the only person who has the antique chair that my mother has that was my grandmother's that no one else is allowed to sit in except my daughter? Poor Maya. Every single time we sit down for the dining room table, we have to fit like, you know, 20 people at the table. There's one chair that has to get pulled. It's my great grandmother's. And it's probably not in particularly good shape. And Maya, my daughter, is the only person allowed to sit because she's 5'2, but she's also a gymnast. So she's and she weighs like next to nothing. But that's also profiling. Think about it. The school has to be told, oh, you have to sit in that little baby chair. Every time they do it, she rolls her eyes and looks at them like, oh. And it just kind of makes her feel different than everybody else. So basically, we're going to learn how to make people feel good about themselves. How consumers select things, how they use things, how they dispose of goods and services, and how they satisfy their personal wants. And we're going to basically analyze our behavior. And that's what this class is about. Now, let's be honest. We're all consumers, so this is not a difficult class. This is not a class in which you have to put yourself in somebody else's perspective because we're all consumers. The thing is with consumer behavior is it tends to group people together. And sometimes when you look at groups, you'll think to yourself, well, is it a little bit derogatory or is that grouping a little bit 
discriminatory. But when we're looking at consumer behavior, we're not looking at those groups as if we're saying, you belong to that group, but it's that. We're just saying that group of people may behave slightly different than this group. So if we happen to be in an area with a lot of people who fall into this particular group, we need to modify the way we sell. That's it. And that's the one thing that's interesting I think about it, um, marketing and consumer behavior in general, is, is that there are certain things that are different about people depending on where they live or where they grew up or what they were exposed to or what cultures they come from or what church or synagogue or mosque or Wiccan circle they belong to. All those things affect us. And they do affect our consumer's behavior. We're going to see all the different pieces that come into that. So we're going to look at the life cycles. We're going to look at touch points. We're going to look at places where people look for. And we're going to look at the whole goal of touch point management, which is called T CTM. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to find out where consumers, where their behavior, can we touch them, modify their behavior so that then they like us. So think about it in terms of this. Perfect touch point management. And I was thinking about this the other day because my daughter was got into a school issue map book, right? She has a map book issued to her when she entered her freshman year in high school. It's got this strange case that's supposed to be indestructible, but let me tell you, I'm sure that it can drop. Okay, see, yeah, okay. Now, yeah, granted, my that's pretty careful, but I could definitely have seen if my son had it when he was there, but we would have thought we would have been on their second half. Anyway, it's just the brokers to it. Okay. So anyway, school is your map book. You get your freshman year. Now you can, you go to college. What? The thing that's gonna have changed about the beginning of that. What kind of computer you're probably gonna most likely want? Map book. Why? Because at a point in which we manage this consumer, when we touch them, when they were most likely to start to get into habits that were going to be based on their own habits, not by their parents, and that's usually somewhere in your high school, college years, we touch them. So companies like Dell and IBM and now um, Microsoft with their, uh, their Chromes, they're going high heavy trying to get into different school systems in order to basically hit the person then because then the person probably will become fairly loyal to that particular type of book. So there are two oh, there are two approaches to consumer studies. We're going to start off here and we're going to move here. The first one is individuals. Guess what it's about? What's your guess? It's all about you. Ta it's all about you. It's all about interpersonal. It's all about what motivates the person to make the decision they make. The consumer's behavior. What is about this that makes the consumer decide to do whatever they're going to do? And we're going to spend a little time on that. And then we're going to move into the cultural level. We're going to be more looking at what is about society and our cultures that make us do things that we do? I grew up on the East Coast. I have different habits than if I had grown in the Midwest. It's just the way it is. Sometimes they drive people crazy here. Some people will say sometimes, oh my God, you're in North Carolina. That's what they really want. They want, well, they want me to come down. They're like, oh, that's me. Please, just stop in New York. Because I've got certain habits in New York. Now, there are certain things about Midwesterners who drive me crazy. Because we just culturally have different things. And depending on what other cultural groups you'll be in, we'll affect that as well. My husband grew up in Chicago, right? Kind of a strange city because it's kind of a Midwestern city and the East Coast city all in one. But we also grew up with parents that were Jewish. He's going to have a very different perspective, but he also grew up in a high school that was 55% African American. Gives him a totally different perspective. There are very few non inner city schools in the United States that are in that high population of people of color. So he has a very different perspective than somebody who went to a school in the inner city or school in a, in a traditional suburb that might be more of a racially mixed 
So that's how we're going to handle this. So we're going to do a little intro this, this week, then we're going to go into the individuals, then we'll hit the cultural. Okay. So the text kind of looks like it this way. They start to bring in this thing where they start talking about all these different notions that come into what makes us behavior. Then it'll go into what behaviors are more social. And then they'll talk about how they affect our consumer decision making and how we adopt things. But there will always be market research and consumer research in here. Why? Because where in the world do we get the data? How do we know anything about anything? We have to collect data. We have to collect information about people. People had to tell us something about themselves that made us know what they were going to do. So what kind of studies are there out there on consumer behavior? Well, there's psychological studies, you know, where they actually go in and they go, this is where psychologists get involved. Why do people do what they do? Why do people, you know, react the way they react? Then you've got social psychological studies. These are more studies in which we look at social structure. These are the things that we tend to do in kid, kindergarten and first grade when student teachers come in and they do studies on us. Anyway, public place to see. For instance, I was in one when I was in, in um, primary school, and it was all about being left handed because I'm left handed. And they wanted to know how left handed children differ in their learning than right handed people. Then there's the notion of looking back in time. This is where you're looking back and you're saying, okay, let's take a look at somebody's behavior in the past and let's see what made them behave the way they behave. And then, of course, the economics, which is why people who are economics majors frequently look at consumer behavior, and people who are marketing majors frequently get into economics consumer behavior. And last thing, you got sociology. So, can we have a social science go to the time? So, Mayor Bloomberg. Does anybody know who these are? What? what? What beautifully big city he was mayor of. Yeah, the Big Apple. Well, anyway, he decided that the whole notion of obesity was all because the sodas were too big. Right? It's all the sodas fault. It wasn't the super size meals or the fact that we don't have any time when we all buy fast food. No, it was all about the soda. So he did any beverage bigger than 16 ounces. And he really found out that basically he felt that this was a contributing factor. And yes, it probably is a contributing factor. But the contributing factor probably has to do more with the fact that when were you buying that 16 down the street? And where were you buying? McDonald's. And what were you eating with that 16 down the street? You got it. So what they ended up doing was this ban was designed to modify our behavior. One of the things that public policy does in the United States is we look at consumers' behaviors and we as a society decide we disagree or agree with them and we put policies in place to ban them or to modify them. Think of other ones, vaping. We put policies in place to, to, to reduce vaping, correct? Marijuana legislation, one of the biggest ones, right, in the United States today, probably one of the biggest bones of contention right now. We either for or against the legalization of marijuana. There doesn't seem to be a lot of gray area in the United States right now. There is legislation that differs by state on whether marijuana is legal or not. What are we doing? We're modifying consumers' behavior in that state based on whether or not we believe that the substance is legal or not. The way we sell alcohol in different states differs. In Kansas, you can buy alcohol in, you can buy beer in a grocery store, correct? You can only buy hard liquor in a liquor store, correct? Go over to Missouri. If you walk into Walmart in Missouri, what can you buy? Anything. 
free for all, right? Clearly, two different perspectives on consumer behavior. We have 50 states, believe it or not, we have 50 unique ways of handling alcohol alone. <laughs> and then you get towns involved, like Lawrence, okay? For the longest time, Lawrence decided that the best way to solve college students drinking was to make Lawrence a dry town. So for the longest time, back in the 60s, Lawrence was a dry town. There was no, you could not buy alcohol in the town of Lawrence. It didn't work by the way. But this college shouldn't do. Yes. It's very simple. I grew up in, um, I went to college in Vermont. Vermont was the last state to uh, raise the drinking age. Drinking age in Vermont was 18. What do you think happens on a weekend in Vermont? We can become a very popular college campus on the weekend, yes. All the kids who went to school in um, Massachusetts or in New Hampshire, guess where they came to, to, to hang out in on the weekends? So you can only modify consumers' behavior so much depending on what you think about. So one of the things you have to think about when you're thinking through consumers' behavior is what are they going to do once you do what you're going to do? So, what are we going to do when we put the mask on? How are consumers going to act? How are we going to do things? For instance, Barrow's Cup. Okay, that's our coffee shop. Since we came out, because we're wearing masks, because we have the social distance, because the library is pretty much closed, guess what's happening in Spyro's Cup? Mm -hmm. yeah. We're very low business. So please. So, you want to acquire a pet? Dog, a cat, a gerbil. Daniel wants a rabbit, I can tell. You've always wanted a rabbit, right? A big dog. What kind of dog? Uh, okay, so we're getting it wrong. So what kind of decisions do this is entail? Well, we gotta learn about the pets. We gotta make sure that we can, we can handle this pet. We might have some friends, right? We gotta decide where we're gonna get this pet. Are we gonna rescue? Maybe somebody has a mix. A mix might be okay. Well, maybe we don't, you know, maybe we don't care. We gotta decide how much we want to pay for it. Oh my goodness. Well, if we get a blue thoroughbred rock well, a puppy, it's gonna cost us two thousand dollars. Wow, that one at the mud, that mud at the uh, at the shelter is looking really good for forty-five dollars, and it's already speed neutered and it has all those first shots, and again, yeah, it's about one of their mix, but it looks just like it. Hmm. Who's gonna take care of it? You got any roommates, Daniel? Okay, how do your roommates feel about the stock? Are they gonna, they're gonna let it out when you're gone? Yeah, see? Are you gonna put it in the crate? What are you gonna do with it? What kind of supplies and services do you need for this thing? And where are you gonna purchase them? Hopefully we have to go to Walmart or look at Amazon online or Chewy, right? And how much are you going to pay for it? All those things went into that one buying decision. And those are all consumers' behaviors. And you've got to modify and help consumers decide on each one of these points what you want them to do. And then once you decide on the dog, then you've got to start to look at who is involved in this decision making. So for instance, a lot of times when we're trying to sell something, We've got to look at who is the person who's instigating this behavior. Who is the person who's going to make somebody do what we want them to do? Is there a kid? Oh, kids are very helpful in the pet acquisition, aren't they? Are they motivated? Are we trying to teach responsibility? Is this some kind of cultural value involved? Is this pet a worthwhile investment because we're going to teach our children how to be responsible because they're going to get a pet and they're going to all of a sudden learn responsibility, by the way. Never works. Or do you have some attitude towards certain pets based on previous experience? Oh my gosh, I knew this person who had a ferret. She was crazy. I don't want a ferret because ferrets are crazy people, so I'm never going to get a pet. Ferret, ferret. 
go back go to the way we make decisions. There's a certain amount of attitude involved in every decision we make. And then you've got to decide on all the other things. Now, pets are notoriously an impulse purchase. You walking by, the pet shelter has them out in front. Oh my goodness, it's an adorable puppy. And he loves it. He cuddles him and he gives him kisses on his nose. It's the best thing ever, right? And then what happens, Daniel? You got a puppy. Impulse purchase. Or it could be something that takes quite a long time to figure out. And then there's the whole issue of reference groups. People tend to have and make certain decisions based on where they live. This is craziness. This is absolutely true. Okay, so I live in Overland Park. I live in Overland Park because that's where my job was before I came here. Would I have chosen based on everything I know now? Probably not, but that's okay. Anyway, here's an observation I've made about behavior of people in Overland Park. Hold on. Many people in Overland Park own Jeeps. All right. Jeeps are very good. We have to own one. Not, I'm not driving it, but okay, we have to own one. But they don't just own a Jeep, they own a Rubicon. Anybody know what a Rubicon Jeep is used for? The big difference between a Rubicon Jeep and a normal Jeep is about $10,000 and the fact that it can crawl. In other words, rock crawl. Which means I offer it, correct? Here's my question to you. How many people do you think in Oldham and are actually rock crawl? Why did I know that? So your reference group will pay make a lot of difference in what you buy, whether it be a dog, whether it be a car. And some of us, hopefully everyone in this room, will be intelligent in their decision and not go where the birds of the feather go, but make your decision based on what you want. By the way, I do not have a little question. Even if I put every option I wanted on my car because I wanted to go crawling, it would cost me less than $10,000 for the stupid sticker. I don't see myself crawling that lovely. Anyway, and then you may have opinion leaders. You may, when you buy a pet, the person may say to you, this puppy just loved this food. And what kind of food are you going to buy the next time? You may have word of mouth. Hey, what pet do you use? I use Shelly Shoe over here, and she's wonderful, so I think you should use her. That's how you get the vet. The need for additional expenditures might be because Joey has this great harness for his pet. I should have that same harness. It works really well. And then, of course, there's the treats and everything else that follows because it becomes part of the family and Santa Claus has to come visit the pet too, right? Because otherwise the pet's going to be upset on Easter when the Easter Bunny doesn't come or Santa doesn't come. Don't laugh. My daughter convinced my son and my husband of that. All right, when she was little, obviously not now. <laughs> anyway, so what we come up with is we come up with the notion of the fact that we are always buying things and the consumer is literally the focal point. They're the part that we have to do. And every activity that we make has to do with modifying this behavior of this consumer so that we know what they want. We can't produce something if we don't make it such that the consumer will actually use it. About Mac and Macintoshes, when you think about the way Apple handles every update, every enhancement, we are the commanders of the production being driven by this consumer focal point. They're always listening to what the consumer says. Starbucks is great at this too. They listen to what the trends are, consumers comment, consumers actually saying, hey, I think I want this, I want this, I want this. All of those types of comments are really what's fueling them their improvements. And then we're looking at customer satisfaction. If consumers don't like it, what happens? Back to the dog. We get back to the ferret and the crazy ferret lady, right? Then no one buys them again, do they?
Okay. These change agents, those are people who modify our behavior, change our behavior, make us change. So, why do we like these change agents? Because they're helping us know what to buy. How do you know what exists unless somebody tells you? How many times have you been looking through some social media and all of a sudden some guy comes up and you go, hey, that was kind of cool, and you look at it? What is that? They're kind of modifying by using that as a change agent. They're modifying the behavior. They're telling you what's going on. What's the arguments against doing this? What's the arguments against marketing being used to change people's behavior? Well, why do we have a right? Why do I have a right to tell you that that product is good for you and you lower your cholesterol? And we're manipulating people. Classic argument for all marketing, it's a manipulation, right? There it is. So contemporary society allows a consumer to be quite a bit more savvy than maybe in the past. Let's be really honest, okay? If you think about it, what do you think happens here? We all have every piece of information we need to decide on what to do. You want any pair of shoes? You could go into a store and you could just buy them. Or you could go online and see the 12 variations that of the band, correct? Well, you can go online, check them out, see what colors they have, see what applications they have, maybe custom design them, right? You never had to walk into a store, did you? Those all those things all allowed you as an individual customer to decide and make a decision without a bunch of people talking to you. Now you can go into the store and you can talk to the salesperson, but sometimes you can do all that research all on your own. So one of the things that's shifted in the way we handle consumer behavior is consumers now want information. They want to know. So I referred you to that nice bet, remember? Mm -hmm. Well, you're going to go check around online, aren't you? I am. Mm -hmm. You're going to read her reviews. You think that happened 10 years ago? And because of that, we tend to have a lot more marketing-related innovations. Because people are allowed and constantly <laughs> providing feedback to everybody, a lot of what happens in society now are innovations that are truly driven by the fact that we tell people and we do things that help them do what they need to do. So nearly everything in your home can be connected via your smartphone. What are we doing? We're making things convenient, but we're also enabling people to communicate easier and faster. And chances are, it all started with somebody figuring out that, wow, wouldn't it be cool if my phone could order things for me? Or tell me when my Amazon packages were coming? Or remind me when I'm going to have to rebuy laundry detergent? Which, by the way, mine does. <laughs> Another trend is the self-driving cars. Now, will we really go to self-driving cars? What do you guys say? Um, oh, bro, yeah. oh, boy, those self-driving cars created some really cool innovations. For instance, um, the notion of a fact that you put your car into um, cruise control and you get too close to the car behind you, it automatically reduces your speed so that you won't hit them. That's pretty damn cool. Think of how many accidents things like that would prevent. Backup mirrors. You, you know, it, backup income. Now, if you get too close to something, it just stops. So although the self autonomous cars are, are moving very, very slow into the market, some of the innovations that they have created have really helped the safety of cars in the United States as a whole. Tesla.
Tesla, Ford, GM, Toyota, Volvo, Hyundai, Mercedes, Audi are all big players in this whole notion of self autonomous cars. But they also, if you notice, are also some of the leaders in safety in cars. Why? Just because we haven't gone to self autonomous cars doesn't mean that we can't use that stuff to make our cars more safe, right? And the more we use that, the more comfortable all of us will be in our cars taking over little pieces of our lives. And it'll become easier, easier, and easier for us to remember and want a car that drives itself. If the car already stops when we get too close to somebody, if the car already stops when we're going to back up into something, if the car beeps at us and we switch lanes, what's happening? We're getting used to the concept that will eventually get us there. Very similar to I hand you a, a, an apple computer when you're a freshman in high school. See, that's how it's working. It actually makes total sense. Drones! What do you guys think of drones? A few years ago, this was a big thing. Oh, I've lost them. Oh, well, there it is. There it is! Everything we ever gonna buy was gonna get dropped from drones. Two years ago, everybody was panicking that this was gonna happen. Now, I've had quite a few Amazon packages in the last few weeks, and I don't remember any drones dropping any of them on me. But it is cool, and we'll get back to this, because by the way, we'll start looking at drones in one of our business case studies. All right. So let's talk about homework. Did you guys all post your homework? Did we? I brought it by. Okay, you need to take a picture of it, okay? Have a picture. Just take a picture email it to me so scan it. What? Is that where you just take a picture of it and email it to me? Don't email it to me, post it. Engage? Engage, yeah. Engage. Yeah, but it's still taking because I just checked and it says it's over. It's okay, it'll take it. I don't think I lost it. Right, and then I told you that that was the wrong spot, and I, told you, and I did check, I'm sorry. Okay, so what about hamburgers? Looks good, I'm hungry. All right, so the menu labeling laws. Did you know that you have to have 20 stores or more in order to have to label? Under that, you don't have to label anything. In other words, so it's exempting a bunch of little stores, right? It's exempting little restaurants, little movie theaters, amusement parks, bowling alleys, everybody. Did you think this law was discriminatory? Mm -hmm. No. What did you think? Did you think it was fair? Do you think it was fair that those little establishments got special rules? I don't think it's fair, but I don't think they have the funds to make it analyze it, see how many calories they have. Because I don't think it's gonna be they're gonna add more expensive. So you thought it was in the consumer's best interest. I also think they were trying to like target the bigger restaurants. Maybe. I don't know. I think it is, but it makes sense why. Okay. I think like more people are going to go to like the bigger chain, so yeah. it's like a bigger target. So they're kind of like just um, with some control, like to get bigger chains of things. Okay, so what you're saying is, is that when you look at the entire pie of people eating, if you hit those people with 20 more, the 20 or more stores, you're going to get a huge portion of the people eating out, and that's going to at least modify some behavior. Yeah. What are you thinking? This is really weird. I can't move back here. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's like the industry between more locations like McDonald's are known worldwide and they they put out special ingredients, like specials about like a different sandwich or anything like that and stuff like that. And like they're just known to not be as healthy as like smaller or any other um establishments that's smaller than them. So I think I, that's why I, really, I think it's pretty fair. So you're thinking, okay, so we got kind of two two kind of big arguments. One is, all right, 
they represented the biggest portion of the of the eating, so that makes sense. But you're also saying that they're also representing the biggest portion of the unhealthy. Hmm. Interesting. Anybody else have another thought on that one? Yep. Uh, the chance to have 20 or more locations cover more area in the country, and so it also get more consumers to see what's not good. Okay, so so in theory, they're kind of becoming almost like a public service announcement for the rest of the things. Like, for instance, if you see how unhealthy a hamburger is with all that sauce, regardless of whether you bought it at McDonald's or you bought it at Joe's Barbecue, you now are consciously aware that the hamburger might, you might want to pick the chicken instead. <clears throat> all of which are good things. That was probably the issue behind it. The other issue is, of course, the economic issue that you guys brought up, which is huge. The little ones, it would cost them so much that they would basically get run out of business. Just as actually with COVID, this is becoming a big problem for small businesses. Because they get so much bolt to do it. So, you got the justification. Should we answer all the questions? Do one. Woo -hoo -hoo. All right. So, restaurants want us to make these healthy claims, right? Low sugar, sugar free, low fat. And basically, what do we find? What do we find out? That basically, if they contain no more than three grams, they're allowed to call it low. However, restaurants offer serving portions several times higher than the standard. So, what does this mean? So, this means that it may be low sugar. If you had eight ounces of it, so when you have 20 ounces of it, it's no longer low sugar, is it? Because now you have 20 ounces, so now you have three times, I didn't do the multiple, did I? Three times two, three times two and a half. So to curtail this understanding, they wanted the actual caloric count. And they wanted the solution. The solution would be what? What is the solution to this? How do you handle this? Stating that on, on the phone, like menu and stuff like that, like for it, it only counts if it's like, like for serving, I guess, and it's only one to three grams in that case. So, like you can say, all right, so this so this is this is low calorie and it's um for a serving of eight ounces, which is half a serving. Yeah, you can do that. Anybody else know any other ideas? Yeah, I just thought like how many old how many. I made it one more quarter in all the same thing. Yeah. But the note that says, okay, go back, serve the hands is fine. Kind of like I have to live with the free though. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> or just don't eat anything that has very costly. It's also the problem. All right. Any other ideas? If you notice, the big chains seem to be doing this quite a bit. Like if you walk into, oh, uh, pick, pick a place. McDonald's even has it now. They have the core, some of the places. And they may not have it in the Midwest, but in the East Coast, they have it. They actually list the core if they're doing huge thing. Um, I know that some places do, some places don't. Um, but you can get it on everything. In other words, if you go onto their website, they are listed. But these claims are one of the biggest problems that the United States has. We have a really hard time quantifying what sugar free is, what low calorie is. And when we quantify it, we're quantifying it based on serving sizes, but yet most of the things that we sell are too big for the serving sizes. So how many people have ever bought something that says it's 90 calories? You think, oh, it's not too bad, and then you buy that and just drag it to me. Two servings, not one. <laughs> and all of a sudden it's 180 calories, and you're like, ah, that wasn't so good. Candy bars are notorious for that. Okay, see, since consumers are left with a major responsibility, I'd say they definitely are, huh? I'm making the right food choices at restaurants. How could we become more knowledgeable and maintain a healthy lifestyle? And is everybody equally interested in this, all this information? Or how do we handle this so that the people who want the information can get the information and the people who don't give a potency won't get it? 
but we're modifying everybody's lifestyle accordingly. I mean, the notion behind it makes sense, okay? Like, if you were to go to McDonald's, I'm going to pick up french fries today. What do you guys think? French fries cool? <sighs> They can look it up. 
If they want to know whether they've had a sodium issue or the fat issue or the carb issue, they can look it up. But at least they would know that a large french fry is what do you think? 500, 600 calories? It's a lot. 365. Okay, so a large is 365 calories. My guess is quite a bit of fat. Probably no protein, quite a bit of sodium, and a lot of carbs, right? Okay. I'm sorry, he wants me to email him a text message? Him? No, he said he wants you to respond to the email text message. Did he send me the email text message? Yeah, he said, uh, yeah, he said, at the class, can you ask her to respond to my email and text message? I think he did both. Okay, sure. D-Y-L-A-N, that's, that's how you spell it. Okay, no problem, I will definitely do that. 